Okay, you are on, Harold. Harold, take it away. Can everybody oh. see the screen? Yay! Yes. All yes. right. Well, this is our intro screen. This is, I, Patricia, I think that's a picture of you, right? It is indeed, yes. Good. <laughs> My husband took that. Good. So that's pictures of us. That's pictures of me with my larger old Canon setup. And away we go. Wow, that's amazing. Um, I'm going to go through, I did a presentation for the local Richmond Scuba Club. So I had a lot of camera basics in it. I took out a lot of those slides, but I did leave a few in just to uh, go through and try and relate them to underwater. Then Patricia will go through the snorkeling and then I'll go through scuba. And then if anybody's got questions after that, we'll go with that. So let's go ahead and start. <clears throat> First, I'm gonna get into just some photo basics. I won't spend too much time because most of you are pretty seasoned photographers. This is just a uh, social distancing picture. It doesn't apply underwater. This is just a little, um, thing I put on sometimes because people go on about, you know, having expensive cameras are the only ones that take great pictures, which isn't true. That's very cute. This is just the one, you can just read the little dialogue <clears throat> where the host is just complimenting the photographer on, you know, what great pictures he had and say, you must have a great camera. And the photographer answers back, well, that was a great meal. You must have a great oven. <laughs> so just, just to say that it doesn't matter if you're using a point and shoot or a high-end camera, you can still get great pictures. I remember about five or six years ago, a friend of mine won the uh, best in show with a point and shoot camera. So you can get great pictures with different cameras. This is just, um, as far as metering goes, this is something all photographers really need to understand or the relationship between aperture, shutter speed and ISO. I always shoot in manual. I don't shoot in any other mode anymore, except for HDR, I'll shoot in aperture priority sometimes. But everybody really needs to understand the relationship between shutter speed and aperture and what it does. Try and get out and practice shooting manual. You'd be able to get a lot more creative shooting in manual than you will in shooting in auto or some of the other modes. Everybody should be familiar with the um, histogram. This is basically what a histogram looks like and what it means. If you have a lot of your picture on the left, it means you have a lot of blacks. And if it's pushed over to the right, it's all white. And, um, this is something you need to be aware of too. A lot of cameras in the display will show you a histogram so you can kind of see. But when you're shooting flash underwater, it's a little more difficult because the, uh, the flash makes up for what you see. And this is just some quick differences, <clears throat> what the histogram looks like with underexposed, correct, and overexposed pictures. Focus points. For underwater, I don't use the, the single point. I use, sometimes I use spot if I'm shooting on the reef, but usually I use a more expanded like the AF expansion for fish to try and grab them. But I don't want too many focus points for shooting fish because then you could easily pick up a reef or something else behind it. A single point is kind of difficult sometimes to follow a fish underwater. It's hard enough to uh, stay still underwater. And um, on land, it's easy to move a focus point. That's not so easy to, to do underwater with the fish is moving. You're kind of like a drone underwater, like a drone is on land. That's kind of what I feel like underwater because you can get it all different angles. And <clears throat> for doing night photography for underwater, I have a flashlight because obviously the reef is dark underwater. So I have flashlight to shine on something to use as a focus point to focus on. And rule of thirds, that still applies for underwater photography. This is not a fish. And um, you should be aware of background, what's in the background. And also break the rules. Rule of thirds is just a suggestion, but 
I stray from that a lot sometimes, depending on what's the subject and what the composition of the picture is. Depth of field and bokeh. <clears throat> when I was shooting Canon, I had a Tokina 10 to 17, which is a fisheye lens, and then I had a 60 millimeter macro and a 16 to 35. I can't use the higher 100, 200, 400, because they're just too big to fit in the underwater housing. So these are just some samples of what you have to think about because you don't have a, um, a iPhone. iPhone, I've got a um, app on it which shows the hyperfocal distance. You can put in your camera settings and it'll show you the hyperfocal. And if you're not sure what the hyperfocal is, that's the point at which it's focused all the way beyond that point to infinity. So if your hyperfocal, like that one example, is 7.1. If you focus the camera on a subject that's closer than seven feet, infinity is going to be out of focus. You're only going to be focused a particular depth of field. Like for that one example, I have the second example, the depth of field was four and a half feet with a subject three and a half feet away. So the picture, um, <clears throat> Picture above I shot with a macro lens at f8. I was about two feet away. The hyperfocal distance that was calculated is 49 feet, and that made for less than two inches depth of field. And you can kind of see where it's out of focus in front and out of focus behind, and you do have bokeh. So if you do want bokeh in your underwater photography, you really need to use a, basically one of the macro lens or something that's 60 to 100 millimeter. You're really not going to get a camera larger than 100 millimeter underwater housing. It isn't too outrageously large. And this is just things you have to think about underwater. It's um, a little more difficult with everything in the housing because you have to know where all your buttons are. The more expensive housings have most of the buttons on that housing and you can adjust them the same, but some of them are kind of limited. So you have to kind of set these ahead of time. It's raw versus JPEG. I always shoot in raw so I can do uh, more editing on it. And I always shoot in manual, although some people do shoot aperture priority underwater. Eye contact, a little more difficult with fish because they move around and it's hard to get in front of them. The, um, the Nemos are a little easier because they live in the anemone and they kind of come out at you and you can get eye contact but it's usually pretty difficult to get with fish. A lot of fish can see out the side like sharks, so you could be on the side of them and you, they still see you pretty well. These are just some composition examples. Uh, the one on the bottom with the diver, that's basically using the rule of thirds. That was on a, a wall down at probably about 60, 70 feet. Another one, the one in the upper right hand, we were on diving on a wreck and a friend of mine that dived, she wanted a couple pictures on the wreck. So I got behind part of the wreck that was had a little slot opening in it. And <clears throat> the flash lit that up, colored a little bit, but because she was beyond the flash, she's all blue. Because basically when you get down below 20, 30 feet, you lose all your reds and yellows. And Patricia, you're up. Okay. I have a question for you, Harold. Where was that, um, the picture at the bottom on the previous slide taken? Um, I don't remember. I okay. don't think it was Bon Air. It could be Cozumel. Okay. Okay, just curious. Okay, I'm up. Um, just to reiterate, if people didn't hear me, uh, I've snorkeled on the barrier reef, but mostly besides that in the Caribbean. Um, uh, I've done a lot of trips to Bonaire. It's a great place to snorkel because a lot of the places you can just walk out in the water. You don't need to be on a boat. Um, but yeah, Curacao, Bonaire, uh, the Red Sea. We went to Belize, which was awesome, and Roatan. So that's pretty much my experience. Uh, I've been doing this about 15 years. I'm by no means a terrific swimmer, but snorkeling is something you really 
do not have to be. My husband calls it extreme floating, which <laughs> kind of describes it. Um, we can, next slide. Carol has control here, so there you go. I won't reiterate what uh, this slide is about, but just a couple things. Um, it's very helpful to look where you're going and try to research the creatures you will see there. And not only the creatures, but the coral. Um, it's really helpful to know a little bit about the fish and about behavior, especially. Um, a little different than diving, you really have to know the conditions you're going out in. Uh, it really affects your light and also just how comfortable you are in the water. If it's really rough, you're not gonna have a good time. Um, and you certainly can't take decent pictures because you're moving around too much. So are the fish. Uh, so you're looking for conditions that are bright and calm water, and especially with snorkeling, the closer you are, the better. It's worth it to go with a guide. Uh, they will see something you will not, which has been just awesome. I've gone to, with a guide to in Bonaire and also in, um, in Roatan and it was brilliant because they can teach you things about the fish that you don't know. And the other thing I have to say is the reason I started taking photographs is because you would go down and you would see something and you wouldn't know what it was. So it was playing sort of what's that fish and you would take mm -hmm. a picture of it and come back and try to find it in the book or try to look it up online and try to figure out what it was. Um, so that's how I started out doing this. Uh, we can go on next time. Next slide. Uh, yeah, gear. Uh, I don't have fancy gear like um, Harold does. You don't really need it to snorkel, uh, but you do need to know what it can and cannot do. There's only so much you can do with a small camera and you just need to know what the, what the, uh, the situation is. And this is the big thing, bring batteries, bring memory cards. And uh, most important, know that your camera will fail. Um, I don't know if Harold has experienced that, but um, I have, my husband have. If you can take a backup, do it. Um, so those are the basics. Uh, these are little cameras for the most part that you're taking out. They're upgraded from point and shoot, but still um, just need to be aware of that. Onward. Next one. This is my gear. Um, the red one is my Olympus TG4, waterproof to 50 feet. It's a good little camera. It's got some very nice settings on it. It's about 16 megapixels. And beside it are the batteries and charger. And beside that is a reasonably old version of a Canon PowerShot D10, which is an extremely rugged little camera. We had one, used it for a long time and bought a second one on eBay because you cannot buy them anymore. Um, so that's my tiny, tiny gear. Is that waterproof also the Canon? Yes, and it's, it's, they are extremely rugged little cameras. I have dropped that Olympus um, way down deep and it came back alive. So yeah, and it also uh, transfers Wi-Fi, so that's, oh, that's nice. Yeah. yeah, it is. It is nice. But seriously, you know, once you've got it back at your hotel or wherever, take the battery out, take the card out, transfer it all, put a new card in and go out again because you'll only lose one day stuff if you, um, if the camera floods, which happens. Next. Next one will be fine. This is my new gear. I just wanted to show you this. This is the upgrade from the TG4. It's a TG6 that I have never taken out of the box because this was supposed to go with me on a trip to Palau that we planned for last March. Uh, so that's my amusement for the day. Um, next. This is me. Uh, this is just an example of learn my guide taught me how to free dive just a little bit. I can't go down very deep, but it's worth learning a little bit of how to do that. Uh, I'm, I'm not that deep in the water. That's maybe 10 feet down. Uh, I'm wearing a weight belt so that I have neutral buoyancy so that I can actually dive even though I have on a wetsuit. And that's a friendly little turtle who 
you don't ever, you don't really usually see turtles just hanging out in the sand like that, but he was being pretty quiet. And so I was being pretty quiet too and got a shot of him. So, and that you can see how tiny the camera is by that. Next. Uh, you can get some pretty decent stuff. This, these are Christmas tree worms and they're really tiny. They're like maybe an inch or two long and they, they will move if you touch them, which you shouldn't do anyway, but you can get pretty close. And if you move slowly and get close, that's the way to do it. Um, cause some fish will run away, but some fish will stay long enough for you to, you to shoot them pretty close up. Next. Um, some things, bigger cameras can do better than smaller cameras. And one of them is uh, using a strobe or a flash. It's not terribly useful. Uh, this is a night snorkel we went on. And if you can see it, that little squid is eating a little fish. And so um, we had to take the shot even if, uh, if it was gonna need some, a fair amount of cleanup in post-processing. And as, Her as, uh, as Harold said, uh, you will probably have to do cleanup and color correction, even if it's an underwater setting, once you get it back on the camera, back from the computer. Patricia, were you very scared in the dark underwater? Um, <laughs> <laughs> The first time we went, we were a little apprehensive, I, 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 I admit, but we were determined to do it. And the guide was this sort of um, fairly um, uh, assertive South African woman. And she basically said, here is your flashlight. You will now get in the water. Keep your flashlights on all the time unless I tell you not to. Here we go. And off we went. Wow. <laughs> It is, it is a whole different world, uh, a whole different, you'll see a whole different group of uh, critters. The lobsters come out, the shrimp come out, wow. the eyes light up. Part of, uh, part of the, um, the creatures there are bioluminescent. And um, yeah, it's a little, it's a little, uh, yeah, you, you have to sort of get to it. Uh, I, I still would not be terribly comfortable going out at night without a guide, frankly, but um, people do. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's really amazing once you do it. Onward. I'm putting the settings in, although I do not shoot manual because it's really hard to do that uh, with a little camera, especially underwater. I preset settings that I'm gonna want, a close up, a high speed, a wide shot, and you can put them in memory and so you can get to them pretty quickly. Uh, so what you're seeing are some, are some uh, big piers uh, in Bonaire, uh, it's called Salt Pier, and the coral has grown up around it and they're just, the colors are amazing, um, really cool. And just uh, a little turtle going up to breathe. So yeah, uh, including the surface <clears throat> snorkeling um, makes the, 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 the composition more interesting. So those are my examples for that. Beautiful, oh, beautiful photos. I'm sorry, go ahead. They're beautiful photos. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and just look for the unique things uh, that you're seeing. Um, it's easy to get overwhelmed because there's so much going on usually, but sometimes you just need to like focus on one thing. Uh, and this is a, a set of anemones over here. They're lovely little creatures and they have beautiful colors. And this is a gigantic piece of machinery. That is, as you can see, it's not very deep uh, there. And it, it is, a coral has grown around it. And the cool thing about uh, something like that is that usually if there's a structure, um, baby fish go in it to hide. So uh, you get a lot of interesting fish, you know, sort of floating around on a piece of machinery like that. Onward. And yeah, uh, pay attention to the background. Um, again, that's something that's a little hard to do snorkeling, but if you can do it, it's, it's great. Um, this is a, a, little, a little porcupine uh, pufferfish. 
uh, in Bonaire, and the other one is a Picasso triggerfish on the Red Sea. And mm. they're, again, composition-wise, probably not the best, but sometimes you just can't resist it. Onward. And last one is sometimes you will get lucky. <clears throat> and I was that close to him. Wow. So, and it was that blue. <laughs> and one of the things you have to be aware of in snorkeling is going deeper doesn't help you because you will lose the light and you're on top of the water. So shallow is really a better, a better choice uh, if you have a choice. And sometimes a boat dive or a boat snorkel is really not, it's, it's really fun, but it's not that great to take pictures because, uh, because you don't have a lot of light looking down. So those are my stories and Harold can take it away from there. Thanks, Patricia. Welcome. Thank you. All right, Scuba. This is, um, I'll just tell you what the pictures are as we go through. This is just intro page, but this was uh, diving at the uh, Galapagos. And that's uh, Darwin's Arch, which sits out in the middle of nowhere. It's a pretty cool place to dive. The water's a little rough. It's really cold, but there's all kinds of interesting stuff there, which I, I think I got some pictures of later on. These are uh, basic underwater cameras. If you look at the setup on the, the right side, that big housing and the Canon 5D, that's what I was shooting for a long time underwater. There's arm brackets that go on the uh, either side of that housing for the strobes. So it gets to be pretty cumbersome to travel with. I've got a basically a Pelican case I put it in that, that I go traveling with. I also have a small Sony setup, the one in the upper left hand corner. It's a RX100, and I've taken that on some trips too, just when I want to do a dive with something a little bit lighter and simple with just a single strobe. And the lower left is a point and shoot, a little housing. Way, way back when I first started shooting underwater, I shot with a little point and shoot underwater a little bit. The picture in the middle is a housing for an iPhone 11, which Patricia might be interested in iPhone 11 takes pretty good pictures and they have a housing now that's good for 130 feet. Wow, cool. These just came out, so it might be something you might want to look into for snorkeling. There you go, Carol. Carol just got so You don't have phone. to actually buy the camera. <laughs> yeah, I see that. I just got the camera today. <laughs> there you and go. Now you can get underwater housing for it. And <laughs> Yeah, I got. I, I could. I could snorkel. I think not as efficiently as Pat, but um, mm -hmm. I think I could do that. It's. I don't, I don't know anybody that's used that yet, but I just saw a couple of articles on it, and they said it works pretty well and takes, you know, good pictures. iPhone 11 takes pretty decent pictures, so it's it was interesting. I thought I'd put it on there for the, the snorkelers. I might have to try that. Yeah, look it up online. It's, it's yeah. Sea Life makes it. Yeah. Equipment, you can see, um, that's me on the right, taking a picture of a turtle, and you can see the, that's actually the, um, the picture of me with my smaller RX100 Sony with a single strobe. And the um, shot on the left is a buddy of mine that's got the full setup. And you can see, if you see the camera's got kind of a glass dome on it, that's what is used for wide angle. It's a big glass dome and you gotta be really careful mounting it because they're pretty easy to flood. I had a buddy of mine bump the thing on the reef and it twisted it just a little bit and let water in and it trashed his camera. So you gotta be careful. Um, sometimes when it's dark, we bring a little focus light. If you look at the picture on the left, you can see a little flashlight kind of mounted on top. If you have a dark location, you can turn that on and aim it at your focus point and it makes it easy to focus underwater. And the port is that dome I talked about. For the macro lens, it's a lot smaller. It looks more like a cylinder, but you can't get much bigger than 100 millimeter. Otherwise it would be a, a huge thing on the front and they don't really make them. I haven't seen anybody diving with them. And then there's all kinds of cords 
you connect to the housing, to the lights, to the strobes, to sync the flash. I won't get into too much detail on that. But you have to be careful with the camera to make sure before you jump in the water, everything's closed up tight and the port's on the front nice and tight. And usually we don't, usually we jump off the back of the boat, but usually with the cameras, I get in the water first and somebody hands me down the camera because just jumping in the water with it is enough to knock the thing on the front and make it leak a little bit. Is this nighttime, Harold? Um, no, those are, those are day shots. But deeper, the deeper you go, the darker it gets. Mm -hmm. About how deep were you, Harold, in that image? Um, that one maybe 40 feet, I don't know. That picture on the right, I didn't take that picture. That was some, somebody, a friend of mine took that of me. But I think somewhere around 40, 40 ish feet on the reef. But I've got some deeper ones I'll show you later. That would have been a great selfie. The oh, one on the left, these awesome. are just some typical settings. I do shoot manual. The bioluminescence of these things is amazing. This was shot in Bon Air. Right off the back of Bon Air, they swim out there sometimes. You could probably get to these snorkeling. Yeah. Because this was only at about 15 feet, but it was at night, a night dive. And I think I spent two thirds of my dive just sitting there taking pictures of them. They're just Hi. amazing. They yeah. change colors when they get scared when you get close to them. It's so amazing. Glitter is so amazing. I've done the same. It's just hanging around looking on, watching them. Yeah, they're really amazing. If you do a night dive, just go off the back of uh, Bon Air at night and you can see these things sometimes. And it's just amazing. And you're not very deep. That's the thing. It's no, I, was, no, I wasn't even maybe 10 feet there. Yeah. And the one on the... The right is a shot from the top of a wreck looking up at the dive boat. I got some more information on wrecks later, but these are just typical settings. With the bigger housings, I can set everything and I do set everything manually and I'll talk about the flash here in a minute. These are some more just typical settings. Where, this was where a, are these taken? Oh, probably Turks and Caicos, maybe, maybe Bon Air. I've been to Bon Air, I think, seven times now, so wow. I've got a lot of Bon Air pictures. I've I've been twelve. <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh, it's yeah. My it's favorite. I still love the Barrier Reef. I, that was an amazing place. Yeah. Spent a week on a liveaboard there. It's psychedelic. It really is. It's amazing. Uh, it's, it's an awesome place. I want to go back someday. Yeah, me too. Um, too bad Joe's not on here. We could do a meetup. <laughs> As you know, underwater, you're floating, so you have to be careful of your buoyancy. Your buoyancy, you have to monitor. You wear a BC, which is basically a, a vest that's an airbag, and you adjust the air in it, and in, you have weights on too, so you just have to, you know, after years of diving, you get pretty good at it and you need to stay still. I see a lot of new divers and they're just kind of up and down and all over the place. I don't know how they could take pictures, but you do need to learn how to keep yourself still. And like Patricia said, moving in on fish, you have to move in really slow or they'll go away. This angel fish on the right, I was pretty close to before it's scooted away. That's, that's an example of um, a fish behavior because French angels in particular, first of all, they all pretty much always you see them in pairs, mm -hmm. but also they're pretty curious and they move pretty slowly and you can get close to them. They're not generally afraid of uh, swimmers, which is kind of yeah. great. So they're, they're fun, to, fun to shoot. Yeah, as long as you don't make sudden move, if you make a sudden move or do something. And I'll, just like land diving, I do focus on the eyes mm -hmm. when I'm getting close like that. And breathing underwater too, as you breathe in, you tend to float up a little bit because you're putting air in your lungs. So before I take my picture, I always take my pictures on the exhale and then just kind of stay still and take the shot. Um, 
general rule is you don't grab onto the reef. The reef's delicate. You can break things pretty easily and it's frowned upon to touch the reef. So you have to pretty much stay free and floating next to it. If there's sand or something below, sometimes I'll stick one finger in the sand just to kind of brace myself and take the picture. But with the bigger housing, that's kind of hard to do. This is how you, um, a chart that shows the color loss at depth. And you can see when you get below about, you know, in good, good conditions, you go bright like a full sunny day, below 30 feet, you lose the reds, below 66 feet, you lose the orange. And by the time you get down below, usually below 100 feet, you're just gonna get the greens and blues. So if you take a picture down below around usually around 70 or 80 feet as it gets dark and sometimes even less. If you don't have a flash, everything's just going to be kind of a blue or green cast on it. And there's a lot of dives where we're down on wrecks that are down at like 120 and 30 feet and there's no color. So if you don't have a flash, everything's just going to be a kind of a blue cast on it. But the strobes, when you take a picture down deep, the strobes only have so much range on them. So you need to make sure the strobes are adjusted. And I'll show that, <clears throat> how to do that in a minute. But they need to be adjusted on the subject. And the subject will be nice and bright and show all the colors. But anything beyond the range of the strobe will just be that blue cast. A TTL versus manual. This is on the more higher end stuff. TTL means through the lens, it's metering. And the camera will automatically, through the lens, monitor what the, the light level is and it'll adjust the intensity of the strobe, which is basically <clears throat> how long the strobe stays on. I don't use TTL anymore. I did for a while, but it was kind of finicky. So I just go to full manual. There's a little dial on the back of the uh, strobes to adjust the intensity of the strobes. And from just all the dives I've done, I've got a pretty good feel for what intensity the strobe should be at for the distance I am and what the subject is. Shutter speed. Most of the older cameras and some of the DSLRs <clears throat> just have mechanic, you're limited by the mechanical shutter speed. For with the flash, it's just like a flash you use above ground and you're like 200 to 250th of a second is about the best you can do with those. I switched over to Sony and my new camera has a electronic shutter that I use and I can go as high as a thousand if I want. And with strobes, you can get some pretty amazing pictures. And I would not use anything below 125th of a second underwater because stuff's just moving and you're just going to get blurry pictures if you go any slower than that. Harold, what type of Sony are you using underwater? I have a A7R3. So you have a box around it? Yeah, it's a house. Actually, I'm, oh. yeah, I'm getting a new housing now, but I also have an A9 and I'm considering using that because that's a, a great camera. It's actually just a little better. It's, it's comparable to the um, the, the one DX mm -hmm. for the Canon. I, but I don't know if I want to put that because that's a little more expensive camera. Exactly. Underwater, so I'm going to use the probably stick with the A7R3. It's a 42 megapixel camera and it takes pretty amazing pictures. I above land, I use the um, A7R3 for landscape and other things, and I use the A9 for my wildlife photography. A strobe position is pretty important underwater. You really need to point them forward and out, turn them out a little bit. If you don't turn them out, if you have the strobe straight forward, you're going to pick up all that backscatter. There's all kinds of crap floating in the water. And I'll show you a, a picture here in a second of what backscatter looks like. The strobe will bounce the light off every little particle and you'll see all these little spots and circles all over the place. So you really need to aim the strobe off to the side to get the picture. The one on the left is for a two strobe setup. And then the um, 
the one on the right is a single strobe. I kind of aim it down a little bit and then a little bit to one side. And the flash should be behind the lens. And of course you can get a diffuser on it if you want. Some of them have a fuser. It's just on a little string that hangs off and you can stick it on if you're doing something closer. <clears throat> Sometimes on my macro, I'll use a diffuser on it when I have my macro lens. And this is what backscatter looks like when <laughs> yeah, you saw going through a swim right. through and um, a little bit of sand was getting kicked up. And this is what it looks like if your flash is aimed too straightforward. It's pretty horrible and there's no way to clean that up. So if I had the strobes aimed out to the side, I have other pictures like this with the strobe to the side. It doesn't hit this, hit the particles directly and it doesn't show up in the, in the photo. You might get a little bit, but it's very easy to clean up. Shooting angle. You don't usually want to shoot down. I get better pictures when I shoot straight at the fish or get a little bit under it and get more interesting pictures. But you're kind of like a drone, so you can kind of get any angle you want. It just depends on the, the creature or the reef or whatever you're shooting. Just um, be creative with your different angles that you're shooting and you can get kind of different looks. Macro, these are new to branches. They're pretty incredible. They're tiny little creatures. I think the one on the left's maybe an inch and a half long. I shot these all with my macro lens. These, um, I think all these, most of these were shot in the Philippines. They're pretty wild. I probably have hundreds of different pictures and they're all different, different colors, shapes. They're pretty wild. It's pretty amazing what's under the water. But you need to decide when you go on a dive, having different lenses if you want to, if you're going to do macro, like <clears throat> on this dive, I put on my macro lens because once it's, you get in the water, you can't change lenses easily like you can on land. So you kind of have to know your dive site, where you're going and what's, what's anticipated to be down there and what, what lens you want to use. With the wide angle lens, generally you want to get close and even get closer. The picture on top was, I'm not sure if that was in the Australia or not. I can't remember. I think that was in Australia. It's a giant grouper. Somebody took a picture of me taking a picture with uh, my camera set up. You can see I got the big dome on the front, so that was a wide angle. The strobe. The little orange things uh, helps with buoyancy. They're those little styrofoam things that kids beat each other up with in the pool. You know, you've seen those little hollow tubes, the styrofoam tubes kids have in the pool. I, use, I just cut off pieces of those and I stick it on the little bracket arm and it helps with buoyancy on the camera a little bit because the camera is, is heavy and tends to lean forward a little bit and that kind of helps keep it level. And the picture on the left is one of the pictures I took in that sequence. The shark on the lower left, I think I was about three feet away from that shark when I took it. And sharks aren't as dangerous. I don't, I'm not afraid of going right up to a shark underwater. As long as you don't stick your hand out or do something stupid, and they usually don't bother with you. Unless it's a um, bull tiger or white shark, I wouldn't go near those because they're pretty aggressive. But this nurse shark here, they're pretty tame. I've gotten pictures of them laying in the sand and I've been like laying like two feet in front of them taking pictures and they just sit there and don't really bother with you. And I haven't figured out what this little parasite is on this fish I took a close up of. I thought that was kind of interesting. Does the strobe blind them at all? Um, I don't think so. It's a flash of light. I'm sure they don't appreciate it, but. So, I mean, they just don't seem to, well, obviously they must be moving, but they, they don't seem to be scared of. No, it's just a quick flash. And sometimes it's, it might scare some fish away. 
the area we were in with this large, with this giant grouper here, I think we were only in about 35 feet of water, so the light wasn't too bad. You can see my shadow from the, the light above, so it was a pretty bright sunny day. I don't think maybe that was 25 feet or so, but it wasn't very deep. As Patricia said, it helps to get a book and know the fish and you kind of learn how they react to you and whether they'll let you get close or whether you need to stay far away. And then it lets you anticipate and set up your shots. This was, I was inside a wreck and these two fish were just kind of swimming right at each other. It looks like they're sitting there talking. Yeah, the little, yeah. the, the little red fish, uh, I think it's a squirrel fish. It's a squirrel fish. Yeah, he's, they're, they're really cool looking. But you know, once again, it's, it's, it's knowing where your fish are because he, they hide. They're underneath things always. Mm -hmm. If you want to find them, they don't come out until fairly late in the day. But if you want to look for them, they're usually underneath a little coral shelf or something. Right. And in a wreck, you can find the wrecks because there's all little hiding niches and places. But I just caught this one coming out and this other fish was basically just sitting there. So. I'll get into wreck. I got a little couple slides on a rex. Rex are my favorite thing to do, I think. But pay attention to the background. You know, you want an interesting background. And be patient. Can't be too patient because you only got so much air in your tank. But sometimes it helps just to I'll park in one place and watch fish for a while and take the shot. And there's other things too. Sometimes you find something that's really interesting. And there's more than one photographer down on our dives and Sometimes you get one person that'll go in and they'll just sit there and camp out and take pictures and won't let anybody in. So as a common courtesy, you kind of get in, take your picture and, and move back and let somebody move in. So everybody gets their chance. The reef, the reef is, um, some of them are just stunning with all the colors. When you're down there, especially when you're just swimming around, you can't really see a lot of these colors unless you put a flashlight on them or you pick it up with a strobe. So usually, you know, if you're not, if you're not taking pictures, this would all just be kind of like a blue cast down here with no colors. As soon as you shine a light on it, it just picks up all these incredible colors down here. And also if, you, if you're on a night dive, um, I think that's probably a cup coral on the, on yeah. the left there. Um, it looks completely different at night than it does during mm -hmm. the day. They kind of bloom like little flowers. Right. It's so cool looking. There's a lot of that, a lot of the coral looks different at night than it does mm -hmm. in the daytime. Yeah, usually at night I have my, I got my camera, but I have the flashlight kind of in my hand too and kind of moving it, aiming it around. And when I find something interesting, I'll keep the, the flashlight on it so I have a place to focus because you can't focus when it's all black. And I'll focus on that point and then hit the shutter with the, the flash and picks it up. Some of these were. I, I know it's not a, a photograph thing, but I'm sure you've been in Bonaire. And if you put a flashlight on something on a, on a night snorkel, the tarpon will come. And the tarpon, they're not, they're big, they're not scary, but they're really big and they're really fast and they're mm -hmm. out to hunt at night. And it's it can be a little disconcerting when you have your flashlight on some small thing on the reef and all of a sudden this really big fish comes in really quick. Yeah. yeah. But they don't usually bother you, they're just No, they're, they're just, just they're just big. They just want to get in in the picture. They just want to get in and eat. They see Nat Geo on your uh, wetsuit and <laughs> want to get the picture. Yeah. Um, what I do when I get a new housing, I practice with it on land. I put the camera in the housing and set the whole thing up with the flash and everything. This wasn't a practice shot, but I just take the thing at home and I'll walk around and I'll just take pictures in the housing and make sure the flash is working right and play with it and make sure I'm comfortable with all the settings. Um, the buttons on the back kind of lined up with the buttons that are inside on the camera, but if you get a decent housing or housing with a lot of the buttons remote on the outside, it's best to just walk around the house or go to a site somewhere and just practice with it and make sure your flash is working and just get comfortable with it before you get underwater. You don't want to go somewhere like this was shot was in the Galapagos. 
I shot this from one of the little Zodiac boats after our dive. And also there's a lot of land opportunities when you go on dive trips. This was a trip to Galapagos and we dove around a lot. The water was usually pretty rough there. And um, some days in the afternoon, we would just take the Zodiacs and we would go on to the islands and we'd walk around the islands, you know, with our regular cameras out of the housing and take pictures of all the interesting animals and everything. And a lot of places you go, even if you go to St. Lucia or any of these islands, there's a lot of opportunities for land shots too. So even if you just bring a point and shoot for underwater, like Patricia does, you might want to bring your regular camera too, because there's a lot of land shot opportunities, a lot of these locations you go to. Wreck diving, this is one of my favorite things to do is just to get inside wrecks. Most of the wrecks are usually pretty deep. A lot of them can be 120, 130 feet. And at those depths, your air goes pretty fast. So sometimes you only have like five to eight minutes to explore the wreck if it's that deep before you have to start coming up. Because when you, you dive, you, nitrogen builds up in your blood, so you have to usually make a stop at about 15 feet and park there so the nitrogen dissolves out of your blood. It's kind of like um, a can of Coke. If you shake a can of Coke, if you came from if you were down at 130 feet for a long time and bolted to the surface, it would be this, almost the same as opening a Coke can. All the nitrogen coming out of your blood would be like that. That's basically what they call the bends. And people have died from doing that. So we do what we call a safety stop at about 15 feet and that slowly lets it bleed out of your bloodstream so you can get to the surface safely. Um, like I said, Excellent beware. turtle shot. Love the turtle. That's really good. Yeah, he was just sitting in this wreck, just sitting there posing. The lower left is one of our friends. She was basically, this is one of her first few times going through a wreck. So I was, she was following me up through the wreck. And the one thing you don't want to do when you go into a wreck is get lost because some of these wrecks you can penetrate and go down hallways. And it's pretty interesting. You're swimming down a hallway inside a wreck and there's fish swimming by and everything. It's, it's pretty amazing, but you have to be careful because you can get people have died getting stuck in a wreck and not finding their way out, especially on the deeper ones. This one on the lower right, I was inside a, I don't know if it was like a little machine room or something, but there was a grating on top and you can see the dive boat. I think this wreck was only at about maybe 80 feet or so, but the wreck on the lower left, that, that was a pretty deep dive, I think. You know, we made a pretty quick swim through going through and we came up this little ship ladder here up onto the deck and then got out. The one in the upper right, I was inside a wreck and there was a crack in the hull and got a picture of a bunch of fish going by outside. So you can get some interesting compositions. Uh, safety, you have to think about safety. And I'm really bad at this. When I get underwater with my camera, I'll see something I want a picture of and I'll start chasing it and I'll get, I'll be way away. I don't know where my dive buddy is. I don't know where the other divers are. It happens all the time. But, happens uh, to me too. Ask <laughs> my husband. <laughs> all of a sudden I'm, you know, way the heck out chasing a turtle. And, mm -hmm. yeah. and one way you find, I'll look around, I'll see if I can see bubbles somewhere. But, and it's not good if you have a, a problem, you know, you want to have your dive buddy near. There are, you know, your regular could crap out or something could happen. <clears throat> and if you're down on a wreck like this picture was taken, you know, probably down at 100 to 120 feet, you can't just bolt to the surface because you get, get the bends. And also, you can get lost too if you get away from the, the group. This uh, top picture was taken in Galapagos. There were strong currents, the water, the waves were, swells were pretty high. They were like sometimes eight to 12 feet. And you know, you see here the boat can't see you. And what they did was go around with the little Zodiacs and pick you up and you can see a diver here. 
how they picked this up. So we just waited. There's a little thing called a sausage that's rolled up. I don't know if I have it in the picture, but you can just um, unroll it and fill it with air pretty easily. And it makes like this, sticks out of the water like maybe six, eight feet. And it's bright colored orange. It makes it easier for them to find you. And the Zodiac, getting back in the Zodiacs is kind of interesting because you have to take off your gear in the water, have somebody pull your gear in the boat and climb in. It's impossible to climb up the boat with all your gear on because it's so heavy. So pretty interesting diving there. But you should always keep your dive buddy around. This is a picture on the left. is a friend of mine I dive with all the time that also takes pictures. And, you know, he wasn't really lost because I was right there in front of him, took a picture of him. But there's a lot of times that I've been swimming around and all of a sudden I look around and I can't find anybody. Nobody's in sight anywhere. So... Few dangers underwater. When you're swimming around the reef, you got to be careful. You get stuck with sea urchin. Uh, jellyfish do sting. I've gotten stung by jellyfish. We came back to the boat on one dive, and there must have been 200 jellyfish all around the boat. We had to go up through to get to the ladder on the boat. A couple of people got stung. Most of them are just, I mean, they're less than bee stings sometimes. They're just little annoying stings. There are jellyfish in Australia called box jellyfish in certain areas that you have to be real careful with. They're really tiny. And if you get stung by that, you probably only have about, oh, maybe a minute or two to live and there's nothing you can do about it. So there are things that are really dangerous. The moray eel on the lower left looks threatening, but unless you stick your hand in its mouth, it's really not gonna come out. They're not aggressive. They usually open their mouth, open and close their mouth, and that's how they breathe, basically. But if you got your hand too close, they would bite you. And sharks, the upper left, these are reef sharks. I don't remember where this was exactly, but we were swimming around and found a whole school of sharks all just swimming around. And we were swimming around among, among them taking pictures, and they didn't seem too concerned with us at all. You just got to make sure, you know, you don't stick your hand out or do anything stupid because they will bite at you. But generally reef sharks and nurse sharks and some of those are pretty tame and pretty safe to be around. How do they distinguish between your hand and a giant strobe light coming off your shoulder? I mean, how well, do they? You're, you're, well, I've got, got this big camera with a strobe. I, don't, I mean, the, the camera is pretty close to me, but a hand sticking out. I mean, they might go after a strobe. I've never heard of them going after a strobe, but it's possible. We don't look like prey to them. Yeah, I guess not. You no. look like a sea urchin or something. A yeah, if you look like a seal or something like that, that's why surfboards have that kind of shape. And people are up there, swimmers on the surface are more apt to get. Plus the uh, tanks are a little hard to swallow anyway. Very, I would bet. <laughs> Especially if you're the one swallowing them. Right. Post-processing, I use Lightroom and Photoshop, mostly Photoshop for mine. I do use some of the Topaz project or programs. Um, some people use Capture One. That's a pretty good program, but I don't use it. But he, where I make my general adjustments here, and you can see from the flash, the flash picks up stuff that's close and pulls out the color, but all the stuff in the middle that's out of the range of the flash has just got that blue cast from being down deep. You know, this probably was below 60 feet somewhere because everything's just blue and you can, you barely pick up some of the yellows in there at that depth. And you get down to 100 feet or deeper and it's just all blue cast. So without a flashlight or a, a strobe on a camera, you're not gonna pick up all these colors but there are a lot of tools to use for, for doing that. Color cast, like I said, you can take a picture, especially if you don't have a flash and maybe with a point and shoot and some of those, you get this kind of color cast over it. And just with some minor adjustments, sometimes you can fix it with just 
do an auto white balance or in Lightroom and some of the other programs, if you just adjust tint and temperature, I went from the picture on the left to the picture on the right, probably in about 10 to 15 seconds of adjustments. It's pretty dramatic. And then of course, like all of the editing, then you can adjust hue saturation and then do whatever you want with the picture. But removing the color cast is, if you got enough light on the subject, you can usually remove it pretty easily and you can pull back out the, the, the real colors. Lens correction. Um, I shoot with, used to shoot with the Tokina 10 to 17, which is a fisheye lens. And this was swimming through a wreck and you can see how the, the fisheye lens kind of bends everything. But so just simply going to the, the lens correction in Lightroom, and I'm sure you can do it in other programs, but basically one click, it just straightened everything right out. Pretty easy to do. But these are, the, you know, the wrecks, I just find them really cool to swim through because fish and sharks and all kinds of stuff inside the, the wrecks. Plus you get all the stuff that's growing on the wreck makes for some interesting photographs. And just different techniques. This one I um, <clears throat> did in Photoshop. It was a color picture. I made a copy of the layer, made um, two layers. So I had two color layers and then the top layer, I changed to black and white. And then I just went in with a racer and erased where the fish was and the color from the layer below comes through. So there's a lot of different things you can do just to have fun with your pictures. I have this on the one I did for the, uh, the dive club and it's a nice little chart if you're looking at printing your pictures. And it shows you what kind of quality you're going to get based on your pixel size. And I found there's um, Topaz has a new program out called um, Gigapixel AI. It's supposed to be excellent for upsizing. So if you have a, a one megapixel picture that you really want to do a 11 by 14, you know, it would look terrible if you just blew that up to 11 by 14. But using a program like that, you could upsize it you know, somewhere in the five or six megapixel range and you could print it out and it would do a pretty nice job. I haven't used the program, but I know some people that have used it. And it's, it's they say it does a really nice job. Um, anybody familiar with the web and the face, it used Facebook and post pictures. They have a maximum size of 2048. So if I'm gonna post a picture to Facebook or something else on the web, I'll go ahead and pre-resize it so Lightroom doesn't resize it because they don't do quite a good as job. And you know, most of the time I don't really care too much because it's Facebook, but and for our evaluations, you know, we're 1920 max. And for prints, for prints, like I just said, that you know, there is programs to resize so you can take smaller iPhone pictures or maybe from a smaller one or two megapixel camera or even some older pictures you have, there are programs that can blow it up. Scuba travel. Um, one of the things I really like to do is live aboard. The top left is the uh, aggressor fleet. They do a lot of live aboards. This is the boat we were on in Australia in the barrier reef. And we just stayed on the boat for eight days and just went all around the barrier reef in Australia on this boat. That's the company we were going to be on in, in Palau, the Aggressor Group. Yeah, they're awesome. Yeah. They're really awesome. We also did the Aggressor in uh, Galapagos. And that was awesome too. They have a whole fleet of boats. But they're really comfortable. The rooms are tiny, but, you know, they have a dining room and it's easy on and off the boat. For Galapagos, they did have the uh, little Zodiac boats that, they took you out in because you couldn't dive off the back of that boat too often. In BVI, we were on a um, catamaran. There was eight divers and I think there was a crew of four. 
it was pretty tight, but it was a lot of fun. We just actually sailed and motored around the British Virgin Islands for a week on this catamaran. It was just awesome. We just stopped whenever we wanted. I got up almost every morning before breakfast, jumped off the back of the boat and did a quick dive before breakfast in the morning and got back on. It was a nice relaxed trip. Um, <clears throat> if you get into diving, there's group trips. Um, there's a couple local dive clubs. And there's also, you know, even if you go to the shops, there's a shop in Midlothian, there's a shop out on Broad Street. <clears throat> and they have trips and can set you up and you can buy gear and they're pretty good with the boards I already talked about. Shore diving, Patricia talked about that a little bit. Like one of my favorite places, Bon Air. Picture on the upper right was taken from in the water. It's a kind of a crappy picture, but <laughs> that's one of the places where you can jump in at Bon Air. Is that oil slick or is that oil slick? They that jump. could be oil slick, yeah. yeah. And then there's thousand steps where you have to walk up and down. <laughs> I can tell you a story about that. Wrong. There are like 35 different spots on Bonaire that you can walk in the water and either dive or snorkel. It's right. amazing. So are you in the Most of them are just, you just walk in. Yeah. You usually you carry your flippers out till you get in the water deep enough. And then you just sit there and float a little bit, put your flippers on and have at it. But Bonaire is just fabulous for shore diving. Go there are you, all the are time. you actually in the um, the uh, National Marine Park there? No. 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 no the, the Marine Park. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. The Marine Park is the whole island. Yeah. The whole island is right. So the reef. Okay, that's what I so, thought. You so can go. There's all. You just go any site you want. That's you're amazing. jumping into that. Basically, the we stay at Buddy Dive. I don't know if you stayed there or not. I stay across the street at Bamboo Bali. Yeah. Basically. We stay at Buddy Dive a lot because we know the people there because we go there so often. And um, they, they just have get a great happy hour. You get a truck and you just drive through and pick up your tanks, throw them yeah. in the back of the truck, and then drive out to the site, put your gear on, go do your dive, come back in, stay I out for you, you know, your hour out of the water and go just go to a different site and do another dive and then come back have lunch and go back out in the afternoon and i have a little story about buddy dive the first trip we made to bonaire was not good the the weather was terrible it rained the entire week so we spent a lot of time at happy hours at various locations <laughs> and we walked into buddy dive one night uh had a drink and they were setting up um a movie screen and we're like what's this we have nothing to do let's stick around and it was Anna and Nick Deloach, who literally wrote the books about creatures on the reef, fish and creatures and coral. And they were staying a week at Bonaire, and apparently they come every year. And um, they did an entire talk. It was fascinating. And they were needlessly treated like rock stars. It was, it was very cool. It was just, and it really was one of the things that made that trip memorable and convinced us that we needed to go back in better weather which we did and now we go as many times as we can. Yeah, it's a great place, easy to get to. Yeah. And um, sometimes you can integrate it with a land trip. Mm -hmm. so we went to, to Europe a couple times and just went and dove in the Mediterranean. I, one trip, I didn't even bring any of my dive gear. I didn't bring my dive computer, regulator, or anything. I just showed him my card and yeah. rented gear and dove, dove when I was there couple trips I plan on going, I'll bring my own regulator and dive computer and a couple things, mask, and just rent everything else. Almost everywhere you can, um, you can uh, rent equipment and it's not that expensive to do, especially for snorkeling. Um, yeah, I still take everything with me right now, but. Yeah, I know. took, one story, I took my son to uh, Cozumel diving with me one day and he rented a wetsuit well, apparently the person that had the wetsuit before got all in this fire coral, and fire coral is just nasty on your oh, skin. Oh, terrible. He put the thing on, and he was like rash and red all over. It was horrible. Oh. <laughs> Bring your own wetsuit if you can. That's also one of the things to be to be aware of is is that the coral. You don't just hurt the coral when you touch it; you hurt yourself because there's bacteria 
around it and mm -hmm. you can get a scratch and it will take forever to heal yeah on this it is but the fire coral it will burn fire it's coral is terrible not yeah. very comfortable and as far as equipment goes you know your regulator is your key thing for life support and your dive computer and i always take that as carry on on the plane i never put it in check bag i put my wetsuit and other stuff in my check bag but i would never put my this is the more expensive stuff and your critical life support stuff. So if you get into it, and almost all divers do that, they do it as carry on. And that's it. Absolutely amazing. No idea. And that is a, a whale shark. You can wow, see the diver on the lower right. Oh, that's great. That's amazing. The whale shark, they're about 65 feet long. Oh my goodness. Wow. And that was in Galapagos. That's incredible. And they just kind of, I was swimming as hard as I could swim, and it was just, his tail was just going back and forth really slow, and I couldn't keep up with it. <laughs> They're pretty amazing. I've got other shots they got from, you know, on other dives from the side and the front and everything. And that's amazing. They're pretty amazing. But that's, that's all I got. Unless anybody's got questions. Just amazing. What a great program, both of you. Thank you so much. The pictures are awesome. Thanks, Carol. Thank, Thank you. you. You both did a fantastic job. Yes. Um, blending it together and Explanations. Making, making all of us wanting to go. Right, Carol? Well, not scuba. Not, no. <laughs> I'm, I, I don't mind flying. I like to fly, but I'll, I'll let them go. On. I don't mind snorkeling. I just, when I snorkeled, I, I had this premonition what if this tube gets underwater what happens if i go down and and it fills up with water and i guess because i haven't been enough to you're just on top of the water you just swim just, you take it off yes yeah. or you just open the mask and let the water out yeah mm -hmm. yeah you can tip your mask back and lift it up there's a technique for clearing a mask that people can show you how to do it's really easy but if you're just snorkeling you just go to the surface and tip the bottom open and drain the water out but yeah. And most, Don't most it people, clear and if it's adjusted right, it shouldn't leak. Most places you go, if, especially if you're going with a guide or with a group, they will usually talk you through it before you get in the water. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you've done this, Harold, is go out with the woodwind on, on, uh, on Bonaire. I mean, they only do snorkeling, so maybe you haven't, but there's a whole, it's, it's a catamaran, it's just delightful. And there's a whole process they go through to teach you how to use a snorkel, because I assume mm -hmm. that you don't know, which is, um, which is good, even if you do know, it's always good to hear it again. Yeah. So yes, Carol, come on, the, come, come on out, come in the water. Well, Patricia, okay. when, you, when you went down that 20 feet uh, to get that turtle, uh -huh. how did you uh, prevent the water from coming in the tube? Well, you, you're, you're snorkeling tube. You're not, I mean, you're, you're more or less holding your breath and you know, basically, you know, you, you breathe in, you breathe in a couple of times and then you dive like crazy. And I don't have long to be down there because I'm not. Okay. okay. Really. And then when you come back up, you just blow out the air when you hit the surface. Um, so it, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm not a free diver. I've seen people that do, that's just incredible, but um, I'm not going down all that far before I have to come up. And you don't, you know, scuba diving, you don't hold your breath because you're, if you're at a hundred feet, you know, there's a lot of pressure down there. If you hold your breath and you come back up to Bad idea. even 60 feet or so, your lungs would explode because the air is expanding in your lungs. So you have to continually breathe. If you had a balloon that was filled up where it was just barely filled with air, you could blow air into it 100 feet. By the time you got up to 40 feet, the balloon would be huge, almost ready to pop. Pretty amazing. And I just have one more thing to say about, about uh about stuff. Um, this was, this was, we went on a reef talk before we first went to the barrier reef. And the, the guy who did the reef talk was this crazy Englishman and basically said, you do not need to be afraid of crocodiles and sharks. You need to be afraid of sunburn and hypothermia. And he's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, you need to keep hydrated and you need to protect yourself from the sun. And that's really true, especially if you're snorkeling because you forget, I mean, if you're, especially if you don't wear, um, you know, a full skin suit, which I do, 
Um, but it's, it's very easy to go out there for too long. It gets sunburned and it's no fun. I have done We've it. Done I'm sure. some, some dives in the Caribbean where the water's 75, 80 degrees. Yeah. I've got a three mil wetsuit and if I'm in for like an hour dive, I can be at a point where I'm almost shaking because I'm cold and the water's really not that cold. Me too. I, 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 wear, I wear a wetsuit all the time, even though the water's like in Bonaire is like 85 degrees. But in Galapagos, the water was 50 some degrees. Oh, and yeah, we had to wear dry suits. Yeah. They're totally insulated and no water gets in. But you, you don't think about it when you're under there. You're well, you so don't. If you don't, you're in trouble at a certain point. Right. If you get too mm -hmm. cold. That's really not good if you're in the water. Yeah, There's a lot of nuances burn. of diving that you need to really go through the training. I, I was an instructor for years and taught students and stuff. And it's, there's a, just a lot of stuff you need to know. I'm sure. I'm just impressed with both of you. Just gorgeous work. Yeah, yeah it's a whole new world. It's really it's gorgeous yeah. down there. And that's that's the thing I have to say. I mean, you know, we're showing photos, but the reality is you have to let it be a live experience sometimes and not not look through the camera because it is it's a whole other world and you're just a visitor and uh these things don't care about you but it, they're just so beautiful and i have one more thing to say i just found out this um there is a underwater webcam at a place called harbor view in uh in bonaire and um it's amazing and you can look it up on youtube harbor view bonaire and it it you it it shows what it looks like at about oh probably 10 or 12 feet down and the the number and the variety of fish that you see is incredible it wow. really is bonaire is known as uh one of the top places for fish diversity in the caribbean partly because it's a protected marine park but you'll see yeah it's pretty amazing i love it there yeah when when we go usually we drop the drop the gear off and then uh throw our stuff on and jump in the water and Usually if we're out there for 20, 30 minutes, we'll see 40 and up species of fish. It's, it's, it's fabulous, I love it. But I wanna to go to Galapagos now, having seen Harold's pictures. Well, that's it, seeing your pictures makes these pictures come alive and listening to your excitement. Oh, yeah. I mean, it just, it's a whole different picture when you know that someone you know has been down there and seen that shark or seen that turtle right. face to face. And, it, it makes your photography look totally different. And I've seen your turtle before, Patricia. Yeah. But knowing that you were that Gorgeous. close to it yeah. is just amazing. Yeah, that was, that was one of those things where I don't know why this particular turtle was just totally zen, but I was on a, a group and there, there, it was like pop. -y. I mean, we were all around him and he was just hanging out. Usually you see a turtle, you're lucky if you get two snaps of it and then it goes away. But this one was like hung out there and, I dove under him at one point and I didn't, I, I couldn't lift the camera up because I was afraid I would touch him. Wow. So, you know, it was, like I said, sometimes you get lucky. You never know. Yeah. If you move up slow on him, you can sometimes catch him. I think I had that one picture in here, that turtle way back. Yeah. More in the beginning. It was just sitting there munching away and I just took a bunch of pictures of it. it just yeah. And sometimes they're in, in incredibly shallow water. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen them in less than two feet of water, turtles, and it's it's just fun. Up, up to the surface to breathe, and they'll be up on the surface for a little bit, and then they go back down. Well, I have about 500 over here in the lake, and I can't seem to get a picture of one of them, because every time I get too close, they all dive in together. <laughs> but they definitely don't look anything like that. You need to scuba. You need to scuba your lake. I, I, scuba, no, I, I, I don't know if I'd even snorkel the lake, <laughs> um, but I have snorkeled all over the world and I think it's the most fantastic thing Good that you can you. do. Um, I'd love to dive, but I have a punctured eardrum, so. Yeah, I have it's a not gonna work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you could snorkel and look into that iPhone housing. That looks kind of interesting. I know, I know. Yeah. Well, I'm so you excited. Know, cause then you already have your pictures right there when you get off and you can just post them right away. I'd be so terrified that it would flood and you would lose the, the camera, it'd lose the phone. I mean, I just, yeah. yikes. Yeah, that's only, a phone's only a couple hundred dollars, but when you got a $3,000 camera in a housing, you yeah. get even more nervous. So you get to be real careful before you can do, go through all your checks and make sure everything's 
Titan on their right. Yeah. It does have a water sensor. The big housing, like the one I use, has a water sensor inside. Mm -hmm. So if it does sense water inside, it'll give you a, it'll flash a light, and you can just get to the surface as fast right. as you can yeah. and, yeah. and save yeah. it. But I know people have had their cameras flooded, and they're, they're not happy campers. Oh no! It easy no trash is a camera. Well, it's definitely something to look forward to. And again, a meetup definitely would be nice. Um, underwater meetup. I think that's underwater cool. meetup. <laughs> I, I hear mean, you. <laughs> there you go. Oh, geez. We'd be six feet apart for sure. We wouldn't be able to stay any closer. Um, yeah, you don't have to worry about social distancing when you get in the water. No. Plus, you're wearing goggles, you know. You got a mask mm -hmm. on for mask, sure. Oh, geez. Well, thank you both so much. This was fantastic. And I did get several text messages and emails. It's amazing. Joe's computer is down. What happened with a lot of people, and Bob, I don't know if you're still here to hear this, um, a lot of people did try to sign on to Zoom, but their computer software hadn't updated to Catalina in Mac. And because it hadn't updated, they couldn't get their cameras on. Huh. And what happened with Joe is his RAM wasn't strong enough to download the upgrade and run it. So he's still in the mess of that. Um, Leo did wind up coming on and I think Parks wound up coming on. And um, I think Karen said goodbye. She had to leave and, and she can't wait to see. I'm sure she can't wait to see the recording. Um, yeah, well, I'm fine with um, you recording it and showing and putting it on the whatever. It's a pri it's our private. Um, it's private anyway. Yeah, it's a pri it's it belongs to the club and um Terry or Leo will will make sure that it gets on there. I don't know how to actually get it off my computer. We'll have to work that one out. But um but at least I get to see it again tomorrow. And <laughs> I truly enjoyed it and I, I want to thank everybody who did make it and all those who didn't make it. I'm sure that they um wish they had. And I need both of your addresses, so if you don't mind sending me if you don't mind sending those uh, through an email, um, you get to have our honorary mug because you're a member. So I will either send those to you or drop those off to you. Oh, and please, please delete the, I didn't realize you were gonna put anything on the meetup page, but the blog thing from Artworks misspells my name. Ah, so okay. That, that's a long story, <clears throat> but yeah, we can delete that. Okay, I will work on doing that tonight. Well, thank but, you yeah, both. I'll send you the address. All right. Well, thank you both so much, and we appreciate it. And we'll see uh, you all soon, I'm sure, because I know we've got a couple. Yeah, of it was fun. Coming up. Thank you. It was great. Sunday. Thank you, Bud. Great, great, great thank you very much. See you next time. Great job. Bye. Thank you. Right. Good evening, everybody. Have a Bye. good evening. Yeah, you too. Take care, gang. Bye, Bob. And I think Joe hit it. My, Hi, I Hi, Stephanie. Yesterday with uh, my Mac, and that's probably what happened. Yeah, that's what he's going through right now. He's having a, a hard time. He, he said he's just stuck between trying to download and he's, he's almost at the end of it. But um, again, we don't realize how much storage we have and how much, oh, how much RAM we have and how much we need to be able to download software. And then you get stuck in the middle of it. So I think you're going to be okay, Bob. I think you just need to restart everything. And yeah, that's what I'm going to do as soon as we get off here. Yeah. Um, cool. But it was good having your wig. <laughs> <laughs> um, that place is pretty cool. Um, yeah, I'm sorry I didn't go in there. I was I was set on going to the farms and taking pictures of barns. Yeah, the, the, uh, the people I talked to, uh, they talked to them about.